Hello, it's Dr. Jamie Seaman, and welcome to the Strong MD Podcast. I have an incredible episode for you today. I want to welcome you, our guest, Brandon Suba. He is CoreBank's Assistant VP in Healthcare Banking and works directly with healthcare providers across the country regarding their banking needs. With a successful background in sales and working as a loan officer at CoreBank, he now provides tailored banking services just for healthcare professionals. With Brandon's leadership, CoreBank is delivering top-notch banking and customer service to physicians nationwide. He's not just a banker, he's a strategic partner for healthcare professionals across the U.S. I hope you enjoy. Today, we are talking about money, Mm -hmm. and I'm a doctor. I went into medicine to see patients. I work very hard, but I also knew that this was a career that I'd be able to provide for my family and, you know, my children and, you know, create generational wealth, but this is not my area of expertise. And what good is it to work and not have money to enjoy? Absolutely. So let's, let's go way back. Uh, I was a medical student at one time. I'm graduating college. I actually got married right before medical school started. And my husband and I had, had moved to Omaha. And I, the very first thing they do when you start medical school is they bring in this lady to talk to you about loans, uh, about medical student loans. And I had to pay for my medical education. I was extremely jealous of people whose parents were financing their medical education. But I remember sitting in this room and this woman said, blah, 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 live like a student now or live like a student later, because you had to decide how much money to take out. Now I had just gotten married. And so my husband had a job. So we're trying to figure out how much money do we even need? And that was, I felt like a really hard thing to forecast. So I was like, well, I'm just going to take the max amount because (laughs) I mean, you know, I guess we'll just figure out how to pay. So we joked, we said, live like a student never. That was, (laughs) maybe it was a little callous to go in, to go in thinking that way. But can we talk about for somebody listening that's, you know, Dr. Jamie, way back when, who's starting their medical education, and you're looking at taking out a significant amount of money. Mm -hmm. How does somebody, when they're starting off, start to think about budgeting and loans and what they're really getting themselves into? Yep. So, and, and COVID introduced a very weird concept to student loans specifically. Uh, I come from a mortgage background. I'm full healthcare banking now. But we were able to not include student loans when qualifying for a mortgage because that was just the rule. So people could still buy houses, even mm. though you know COVID restrictions and all of that. So especially students now, they're going to be coming into an environment where some of their classmates maybe have not been paying on their student loans for the last three years. And I don't know if you watch the news at all, but when they flip that switch, people freaked out a bit. Uh, I think my favorite thing I saw on on the news was this, the interview, we'll call it a millennial or them a millennial. And they said, well, I went and bought a house because they said these were going to be forgiven. And now I can't afford both. What am I supposed to do? And coming from the mortgage side, it's all about risk. Mm-hmm. And so the student loan, I, I, I have kind of a soapbox, if you can't tell, because it is just so convoluted on what it was when you came in. Because when you came in, It was, here's your rate, here's your term, here's what you're going to be paying, and it's going to be 27 years. And I, by the way, did pay my loan, and it was not 27 years, but I'm a little jealous of this loan repayment thing going on, but that's, yeah, yeah. Well, and then there's that too. Uh, So, so the, going back to the question, as you're trying to navigate, what does this look like taking on a lot of debt? It's a lot like, what do you do when you buy a home? You can go out and get qualified for a million dollar home, let's say doesn't mean you have to buy one, right? Mm-hmm. Because with a million dollar loan home comes the upkeep, the furniture, all the pieces that you have to do to it. Well, same with school. When you go to school, it's not just books and classes are covered. You are living a life in the process too, right? Yeah. So uh, I'd like what you said earlier, and I think it's before we turn the mic on, and I've got a quote similar to it, but what was it? Live like a student. Live like a student now or live like a student later. Right. And so having that mindset of take out what you need so that you have wiggle room if you need more, Mm -hmm. because if you max yourself out, you'll use it. I mean, Mm -hmm. let's not lie. If you get a paycheck, you save some, but you use it, right? That you live based upon how much you're making. So I would say coming into that first introduction of what these are going to look like, understand what classes are going to look like, what the requirements and what the cost of those are. And then of course, books. And budget off of that. Well, not budget off of that. Base your amount off of that because then you can always come back and get more. But once you take it, they expect you to pay it. Yeah. 
and then and then it starts creating interest. And I think that was an interesting time when I came into medical education. There was the older doctors that got these loans with very low interest rates, and they were still paying on them like years and years and years later. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh my God, I'm going to be paying on this loan when I'm 50. And they said, well, that's because my interest rate is so low and I can invest it in other ways. Mm -hmm. But when I came in, the interest rates were really high and it was scary, you know, to think that like, this is a lot of money. And then, and we'll talk about the phases of medicine, but you know, I got into residency and I was making payments and the interest was accruing faster than I could even pay it. I came out of residency with a loan higher than when I started even making payments through residency. But you said something in healthcare banking. Let's back up for just a second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what, is, what is healthcare banking? So uh, as I said, I was in mortgages and a friend of mine was at CoreBank. That's where I'm at. And each bank generally tries to create a division that is focused on the healthcare. And, and I'll be straightforward with you. It is because of your earning capabilities. Not hospitals, doctors. In the long run. Doctors, doctors. yes. Uh, of course, we like working with practices. Doctor banking. <laughs> But when it comes to to the risk factor, and, and I think this will come up again, but the default rate on a physician mortgage specifically is 0.2%. Mm. It's not a big risk for the bank to take on and they keep them on their books. So it's a little flexible. And, and like yeah. I said, we'll, we'll talk about more when we get into the product conversation. So what Core decided to do is not just take products and stamp physician in front of them, but actually create checking accounts, mortgages, and loans that are tailored for doctors. Mm -hmm. And so my favorite piece that that I like to say is, uh, you have to onboard with us when you get a product, uh, like a mortgage or something on those lines, but you get a concierge, which is me, uh, you get benefits to the account itself. And I'm not gonna lie early on, I said, well, you know, since I'm providing it, can I have one? And there's actually laws in banking that you can't be you can't give favor to certain. Mm -hmm. So we have this created so that we can favor doctors, but we can't just give it to everyone then. So there truly are unique products that are for physicians specifically. But when banks try to get in the game, a lot of the time they'll just take their nicest checking account and say, well, this is our physician checking account and it's worth your while. Yeah. But for us, if you don't have the MDD or DDS. Uh, I was literally about to ask what qualifies it, first. So a medical doctor, doctor dentistry, yep. anybody else? Uh, so that's the mortgage specifically. So okay. if you're looking for the mortgage piece, of course you get all the banking with that. Just this year, we did open it up more on the banking side. So the checking account and loan opportunities more to your physical therapist, uh, psychiatrist, things on those lines. Yeah. For me, what I was pushing was, I talk to the office quite a bit when I'm, when I'm working with the doctors and how great is it that they get to hear all these cool things that the doctor's getting, but they don't get to benefit that at their bank too. So it's kind of a bank at work type situation where we saw the nurses and all those practitioners, we wanted to give them the opportunity to on the banking side. Okay. Okay. So you guys, if you didn't know, doctor banking, healthcare banking, it's, it's out cool there. Thing. Is this um, statewide? Is this a thing that all over the United States? So this is something unique to our community here. It, it is not unique to our community, but physician is pretty impactful in our community. We have some phenomenal programs that people do come from all over the world to participate in. Cancer is kind of what top of mind in that situation. So it's not unique to just us as a bank, because again, good deposits, low default rate, but there are banks that do it well, and then there's banks that yeah. don't do it well. And when I onboard a lot of doctors, my initial question is, at your old bank, did you have someone that you could just call, or did you have to go to an 800 number? Mm -hmm. And the most common answer was, when I first joined the bank, I did have that person. They left, and I had no one after that. Yeah. And I think, and we'll talk about this too as we dig in, it's important that you have somebody that you can get a hold of right away. Yeah, everybody is willing to lure you in. But uh, yes, exactly. Execution is everything. <laughs> okay, so let's go back to this uh, poor little medical student. I do not miss these days at all. <laughs> um, but if you're going into medical school and you're trying to figure out how much money to take and how to live, should you be pursuing buying a house? Should you rent? Do you have any advice for somebody that's trying to figure out how to budget in that regard coming into this? Uh, I do believe dorms are always an opportunity. Is that correct? Well, I think they did have some sort of student housing okay. um, at the time, but I'll be real honest. My <laughs> husband and I had just gotten married. So we, of course, like right. 
wanted to have her own house. But yeah, I think there was some sort of student housing. So I think it depends on where you are in life. Because again, if you can afford a home, great. Now, I do love when the parents buy the home and rent it to mm. the children because there are actually tax benefits to that. So that works really well. That did that. Yeah. yeah, so that's awesome. But it's not always the case. Uh, usually, and in, in my experience, around colleges, they have, they're not always the best homes, but a little lower rent home that three or four people can, yeah. can live in while they're going through school. Student housing is an opportunity there. I do not think it's a great idea to buy a home while you're in medical school. Mm. And the main reason for that is you don't know exactly what your path is. You know what you're studying. You know what you want to do. Right. But if at any point that takes a big turn, why have this huge financial burden that right. you chose to take on when you might lose sleep over your student loans, unexpected things happen in life. So as a student, I think there's huge opportunity to take advantage of rental opportunities because then if things go south, you can just break the lease and say goodbye. It's not yeah. as big a commitment. Well, it makes sense because I watched classmates leave medical school for mm -hmm. other careers, um, get married or have a life change in the middle of medical school. Um, and then, of course, this residency thing where you have to do the match. <laughs> I mean, it was... These days, they've made it so much better. But when back back when I was a resident, um, we walked up on stage and you opened an envelope and it just said, I'm Dr. Jamie Seaman and I'm going to Hawaii. And it was like in front of a room full of people. Wow. Um, and you didn't know where you were going. It was really, really kind of terrifying in that regard. But same thing, you know, four years of medical school, you could guaranteed, but then you might be moving. Mm -hmm. So if you bought a house, you'd be looking at selling pretty quickly. And sometimes that's not always a, a good investment. Right. Okay, so um, tight. You you said in healthcare banking, like checking and savings and things like this. Okay, so you get this loan money. Should should these people just have a basic checking account? Should you be looking at saving any money? I mean, obviously, if you're buying the money, then you right. <laughs> there's there's a cost on both sides of it. But so let's cover that in two ways. So when you take on debt. The best thing you can do to decide if you should save or not, because where interest rates are right now versus savings account versus how much you're paying on, I'm going to use a home equity line of credit as an example. My wife and I had this conversation. There's no reason for us to put money in a savings account at 4% when we have a balance on a home equity line at 7%. Mm. Well, it's like eight and a half now. Oh, no, it came down. It came down just last yeah. week. So when it comes to savings, it's a great idea. And you should always pay a savings account first, even if it's five or 10 bucks, if you can put it away and you never see it, perfect. That's true savings. But I think when people think about savings, they want to have thousands and thousands of dollars sitting for mm -hmm. emergencies or, or things on those lines. Well, I'm sorry, again, you're still living your life. You don't just go to school and, and sleep. So you are going to have costs that come up. Should you have a checking account? Yes. Uh, what I see most common is People bank at a bank just because their parents opened their checking account there originally. Yeah. When you're getting into this field, and and I said this offline too, unfortunately, it's not until residency that you really come become valuable to a bank, unless the student loan side, of course. But that's when people are really like, hey, come on and hang out. Even gotta you said it, people come and make talk. make a graduation day. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So getting kind of going and shopping banks ahead of time gives you an opportunity to really understand, you know, I do like what this product is vo versus this product over here in the checking account side. Uh, one thing that we have in ours is it's free ATMs across the United States. Well, for somebody that's here in Omaha, goes to school in Lincoln or Creighton and then stays here, maybe it's not as big a deal that you can use ATMs all over. But like you said, if you get matched and you're going somewhere else into a different state, right. Maybe the bank you're with isn't the best choice. Now, this is at the younger state because if your parents need to send you money or things on those lines, there's pros and cons to just staying at the family bank. Yeah, uh, I left and I ended up back because of the whole core merger. So it once was my bank and then wasn't. But I will say the bigger banks they do very well when they have multiple locations. Then if your child, if you're in school and you're not at home or in your home state, you can go somewhere and talk to someone. And I think there's value to that. Although yeah. from what I have been told, uh, the branches are not as important as they used to be because it's all digital. Well, I was just about to ask, I mean, what, like, are people really using ATMs anymore? I mean, oh, like yeah. what, like, I mean, everything these days is electronic, you know, you pay with your <laughs> phone. And, and the ATMs are just so you can get cash and people yeah. still want to have cash depending on what you're doing although it amazes me how many places are now 
no cash. Like Vala's pumpkin like, patches, no cash. no cash. My daughter wanted a 50 cent thing of honey and I had a dog. Get out your card. I know. I'm like, you're paying money for me to give I you money. Know. So, uh, so the early days you can shop around. People aren't going to be too excited until you are in that residency. But then again, you're in residency. You're going. It's go time. Yeah. So that's where I think having a relationship at a bank is good. But you should definitely have a checking account, definitely have a savings account. And as dangerous as it may sound, a low minimum credit card at a young age where if you can drive, you just put your gas on it and yeah. you pay it off at the end of the year. That's huge because one of the biggest things that affects your credit score is length of credit. How long have you had open credit? Uh, so people that are new to the game at an older age, they have a bad credit score, not because they're bad with money. They just don't have history to show that they were good with money. Yeah, that was a good piece of advice my mother gave me. Uh, even when I was in high school, she got a card where they could put my name on it, where she paid it off every month. Um, <laughs> but then once I was out on my own, you know, I did the same thing. And, and she was like, never put anything on this card that you can't pay for at the end of the month. And just pay it off every month. And my husband and I were able to build, you know, really good credit, you know, even early in our lives. Okay, so let's make the fantastic transition. You've graduated medical school and you're on to residency. Yay. And you get a paycheck. Uh, let's be real. You're, you're not getting paid for your worth. <laughs> no, I, I do know what residents <laughs> get paid at that point. And um, but it's very exciting. It because is. You're finally getting the paycheck. <laughs> so you're like, okay, yeah, I'll sign up for this. Okay, so you're transitioning to finally earning an income now. What, what do you do? It's your first month of residency. That first paycheck is coming in. How do you start to change the financial strategy? Mm -hmm. uh, are, are we going to dig into budget here? Or is this a good Absolutely. time to kind of dig into the yeah, budget piece? Exactly. So having the discipline of budgeting is truly an art form. Uh, I was in commission sales for seven years, and this is when I was very young. Well, I guess 21, 22. I don't know if that's young. It's now. But that was the hardest thing to budget with because I would have huge paychecks and then small paychecks. And so the one nice thing is in residency is you do get a form of a salary. They're going to tell you that you're going to make this much a year, yeah. um, whatever the pay structure is, but you'll know what you're going to be making and how and when you're going to get paid. That allows you to somewhat budget. Now, unexpected things come up. Again, you should live your life a little. Like yeah. I'm not saying spend all your money, but don't can't take it with you, right? Well, yeah, we um, we did a podcast on this about just this energy bank. I mean, we work so hard in the hospitals yes. that when you do get your eight weeks of vacation for a year, like you want a vacation, like you want to, you know, be able to do things that take your mind off of being stuck in the hospital for 80 hours a week. Yes. And relax. Yeah. I don't know if your blood pressure is good, but <laughs> it's pretty stressful, stressful. And it's not even, well, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think it's even the work necessarily. It's just the demand. Yeah. Because in my experience, uh, when I work with doctors and they have a challenge, I've got about three times I can talk to them. Once in the morning because they're going in sometimes, on their break, which is normally about 15 minutes and you're trying to eat, and then at the end of the day when you're ready to turn off and go home. So my goal is always to have that solution by that third one. Yeah. So then banking wasn't your concern during the day and it was taken care of at the end. And the 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 lunch 15 break, that's the question. That's when, <laughs> okay, I need a couple things. Here's what I need. And, and then we can get that solution there. So in residency, you're coming in, you are going to be making a paycheck. You're still going to want to budget it as if you're a student though, because yes, it's glorious. You're making the money, but it is not to the level of what you are going to be. And what I have seen is resident residents start living that life mm -hmm. of what their projected income is going to be. And then when it does come time, when it does come time to making investments, buying a home, things on those lines, they're cash poor. Where all the others that made the sacrifices and live like the student, they're coming in with a little bit more to work with, possibly even better credit. Mm -hmm. So that gives them the upper hand on moving forward when they get to that stage. Okay. Uh, let's say you're a resident who's married. I had a spouse and he had an income, which was fantastic because he was able to support, you know, some of our living expenses and things like that. Um, so for somebody in that situation, that's not a single person, uh, maybe they just have a spouse. Let's not, let's not complicate this with children okay. quite yet. <laughs> Although that's what I did. Um, <laughs> but if you have, you, let's say you have a little bit more money coming into the family than just your residency mm -hmm. income. Um, what, when should you start to think about, you know, financial investments and buying a house and these types of things? Like, when do you know that it's the right time financially? I'll ask you a question. 
when's the best time to plant an oak tree? <laughs> I don't know. When you have 40, a seed. <laughs> 40 years ago, when's the second best time? Today. When it comes to investing, the sooner you can do it, the better. Okay. And especially because, let's see, residency, you're eight years so it depends yeah. what you do. So okay. the most the the minimum for residency for like family practice would be three years. Okay. OBGYN is four years. General surgery is five. Neurosurgery, the brain's kind of important. It's <laughs> it's six. But then there's fellowships beyond that. So some people are like super residents mm -hmm. and they're in residency for like eight, 10 years if you're a plastic surgeon. So you're getting into your 20s. Oh, yeah. Well into your 20s. Yeah. You don't want to wait until you're 30 to start investing. And again, I think we have this mindset of investing means these big, huge dollars that are producing so much money with this high income or interest rate. And that's not the case at all. If somebody's putting $50 away at 16 years old and they continue to do that, plus a retirement program on top of that, you'd be amazed at what that adds up to. And then there's vehicles that you can put it in to make even more money off of that. So as much as you can put aside on the investing is fantastic. But again, you don't want to do so much that you can't afford to eat or live your life and right. be part of your life. So when it comes to having a spouse or another <laughs> form of income while you're in residency, I think it's fantastic for that person to go down the path of this is my lifetime career. This is what I'm going to do forever, making the investments in the 401k, the IRAs, whichever vehicle. And we'll, we'll actually talk about financial planning, not me. We'll talk about what you want to look yeah. for in one, uh, but that they should be making those choices then, because again, if you're in residency and you decide this isn't for me, which is that number pretty low though. Like once they get to that point. Yeah. I mean, I think there's some people that get into a residency and they're like, yeah, I don't, you know, and they may, you know, jump ship to another program okay, or something right. like that. But I think it's rare once you're that far in to not <laughs> use your skills and assets because you've just accumulated. I mean, I, I have seen that though, the panic of like somebody that goes to dental school and they're like, I don't want to be a dentist. <laughs> How am I going to pay for all, you know, yep. pay for all this. So thankfully I think that's, that's rare, but right. Yeah. Right. Again, just like the default rate you've put so much in and when you quit, they don't just take your student loans away. You still gotta, still yeah, gotta pay those exactly. too on what you borrowed. So I think you're in a better advantage when you do have a spouse or someone else that is, I'm going to say somewhat on the normal side of the world or in life, because you are so engulfed in what you need to do, which is important. Like you said neurosurgery. It's not just a yeah. online test you pass. You <laughs> really God. have to know what you're, yeah, no kidding. You have to know what you're doing. So I think there's a huge advantage to that. And it sounds like you had a lot of fun through your residency and it can be done. I want to be, you're a great example. It can be done. You can have well, start and you, run a life. Let me tell you what we did back okay. then flights to Las Vegas were like $99 Southwest and on Southwest. <laughs> so my husband and I, and you could get free hotel rooms cause we would just, you know, <laughs> sign up for the player's card and we would take a very limited amount of money. Like, okay, we have $200. This is our entertainment. This is what we have budgeted. Good. And our goal was to pay for the trip by the time we came home. <laughs> Now I'll tell you, we somehow got lucky and did it a few times. That's awesome. But it was like a, it was like adult Disney World. It was cheap. You could get free <laughs> drinks, and that's just how we did it. And we kind of laugh now, but um, but yeah, I think there's you know ways that you can do it and oh. not spend a ton of money. But I, I saw people do it the other way. They're like, hey, I'm going to Spain. Like I'm you know I might not have this opportunity once I really get into my real job and I have to work all the time. So you know I think that there's you know personality too of of how people you know are frugal or not frugal but yes so when is a good time to invest in a house i mean mm -hmm. should you have a, a certain amount of money saved what if you're a resident and you're like i'm definitely staying in this town i'm you know this this is it right here when's the best time to start looking at that what i have seen and uh, ironically it's generally the single residents with two dogs i know that sounds <laughs> weird but that's that's what i see the most is they've lived a life where they have excess funds, right? They, they're not, I, I don't know what they chose to do in life, but I get to see bank statements and I'm like, wow, you're actually sitting Saved on a, a lot great of amount of money here. Yeah. Like good for you or in inheritance. I mean, there's just so many things that people gain money for and you right. never really know or why it came and that's not important. So what I would see is they would go find a very reasonably priced home, which that's getting harder and harder to do. And they would invest in that home so their dogs had a yard to run around in. And, and, if, and when I tell you this is common, this is so common. So that I can think of like five med school friends right now. The truth? <laughs> right. So that's what drove them to get a home. But when I pre-qualified them 
I would give them their max number. And I would always say, here's your max number, but here's really where I would see financially you'd be So you're looking at their finances and you're saying, Dr. Smith, it mm-hmm. looks like you can probably buy a home that's in this range. Correct. And you know that he's not going to be eating ramen. Correct. In this well, new house. Nope. nope. Top <laughs> okay, range. You, might be. you okay. might be eating ramen. You might not ramen have level. Uh, yep, exactly. <laughs> and that's what I try to, level. to encourage is we all want to buy the house our first home that our parents are living in now. Mm -hmm. And that's not really how it should work. Best off you buy a home you can easily afford, get the equity and use that to buy the bigger home because then you're putting less of your money on. It's money that you've invested and earned. So when it comes to these people that are buying these homes early, if it's a reasonable home, great move. Uh, And I work with a handful of doctors that are very heavy into the investing in real estate side. So to have a few low cost homes that you can rent out, especially if it's on campus or things Mm -hmm. on those lines, that's a great investment, but you have to have discipline to do those things because you buy a home and now all of a sudden you need a new AC and that's $600 that you didn't have just laying around. Oh no, 6,000. Sorry. Yeah. What kind of AC I was talking about there. I've replaced mine. So now what you thought was a great idea, yeah, I stretched myself a little, but I'll be fine. Now you're borrowing money to cover your investment. investment. So when the timeline that I would say to look for is when you are comfortable with the life you have, and it, everything changes when you get married and kids, but when you're comfortable with that life that you have and you've budgeted your income, if it's allowed, absolutely, you can invest in a home or, I don't know, some people like cars. You know, just that that little extra that yeah. you don't necessarily need. You have an alternative for but you, you can do it. Uh, but it's dangerous because from resident to retirement, most of our mortgage programs, a lot of the mortgage, they're zero down. Mm. So then you're just looking, about to ask, what would somebody expect? Like how much cash, you know, are we looking at mm-hmm. saving? So, it, and it does depend on the bank. I will say community banks that have a focus on this, they are going to give you a better deal because they, they want the business. They want to have you mm-hmm. as, as their uh, client. On the other side, the bigger banks, mortgage is all about risk. The bigger the bank you are, the more regulated you are, the less risk you want to take. So, Physician programs do range. Ours specifically is zero down. So you can come with no money on the table, no down down payment. Um, Other banks that I have seen all the way up to 20%. And you had to have less than five months of your residency before they would offer that loan to you. Where for us, once you have your white coat, we're ready to go. Let's get this done. I want to say ours was like 3%. We were, my husband and I bought our first home with, with a, with a program that was for young doctors. Awesome. And, and, and then our subsequent home. Um, and it was, you know, it's still a little bit of a chunk of money. And then, of course, you're buying this house and expenses that come with it. And, you know, it's, it's yeah, there's there's a lot of things to be considered. Okay, so um, let's get through residency because that's just, we've Bring all, blocked, good we've all <laughs> blocked that out of our minds. So you're graduated residency, you're getting your big, I call my big girl job. Yep. Um, this is an exciting year. I mean, I because that. you're, <laughs> this is an exciting time. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> because your salary is about to exponentially increase. Huge. That's how much for somebody listening. That's not a doctor or a young professional residents get paid. I don't even know what it is these days. Cause I've been out of residency for a while, but I mean, do you want a rough? Um, we had, I mean, I think back, I think back when I was a resident, I think my first year of residency was like $36,000. About 15,000 more now. Yeah. Yeah, in around the fifty thousand range is about residency now. Yeah, I think it was maybe, and you do get a very small increase each year. So if you're in a four year program, it's a couple thousand dollars extra each year. Okay, but there's we got a couple free lunches in the cafeteria, but that was like about <laughs> it. There's not really many other perks. Okay, but you finally have your your big girl, big boy job where you're about to get a lot more money. What do I? What is my strategy in this first year stepping out of residency into the big world? Okay, Uh, I call this the winning the lottery theory because, and I've seen it. In some senses, it has to feel like you're winning the lottery when you go from residence income to your full time in a hospital income because it is it is a big change. The reason I know this is we can base what income is going to be for. Uh, for the approval of a mortgage. Mm -hmm. So we will see what the letter says agreeing to, yep, you're in a four-year agreement and this is going to be your salary for the four years. That is the time when you want to have financial people in your favor. Uh, A lot of people feel, you know, I I make 
50,000 a year. I don't really need a bank. I don't really need an investor. And that's completely opposite because no matter how much money you have, it's how you manage it that matters. I know people that never had high paying jobs and they have a bigger savings account than I do now because they manage their money better than now, mind you, I have a family of four. Well, I am part of that four. Yeah. So we have expenses left and right. But that's where a financial investor planner is very important. Having a banker that you can contact. Uh, I know this sounds crazy, but one of the many things that I got to deal with today was people just signing on into their bank account, just their password not working and they I got locked say, out. What do you, what, what am I calling the banker for? Like, what are, what are the questions that yeah. I'm going to need to call the banker for? So you get locked out. Let's say you have a very busy week ahead of you. Okay. You get locked every out of your own, week. every week. <laughs> <laughs> Great example. Name a day. <laughs> uh, and you can't get into your online banking on Sunday. And you know, come Monday, this is going to be the last thing that you are going to be thinking about. So you don't see your online banking for a good week. Now, nobody uses check ledgers anymore. So you overdraw your account. Mm -hmm. Now you're inquiring fees on these debit card purchases that you're running. And not a single person flagged you, told you, nor could you see it. Now, if you could text your banker and say, hey, I'm locked out. Can you fix this? They text you back and say, yep, you're unlocked now. Let me know if you need a temporary password. It's done in 10, 15, 20. I want to give a realistic time, maybe an hour, depending on the day. Yeah. It's done and you can move on. People don't realize how much it can cost yeah. to not report your banking correctly because of the fees and everything that goes with it. So that's why I think having a banker that you can respond quickly to is good. Plus, plus. You are doing a very specific thing in your career, right? An OBGYN. Yeah. Do you want your brain to be thinking of other things when you're really engulfed in something that's very important no. to one of your patients? No. Okay, well, if you're $5,000 overdrawn and you don't know why, is that going to bother you a little bit? Pretty distracting. Yes. Yeah. So that's why, uh, even with our bank, we check overdrafts every day. So anybody that is listed with me as a doctor, if they are overdrawn, I will see it. I generally, if I haven't onboarded them, I don't have the best knowledge, but if I onboard them, my one of the questions I ask is, if your account's overdrawn, what's the best way for me to let you know? A lot of times I like to shoot me a text message in the morning, I'll have it done, you know, I'll transfer money, it'll be fine. And some are, I have an account, you can move money from that account if you ever need to, yeah. so then I don't have to worry about it. So that's where I think having a banker that you can communicate with is important because it takes all that nerve and crazy off your mind. Now, the other side is the financial planning. And, and legally, I think I have to say this, I am not a financial planner, nor what can I give financial advice for your money. But did you stay at a Holiday Inn last night? <laughs> Holiday Inn Express, <laughs> thank you very much. So, but the challenge there is every financial planner wants to have doctors under their belt because yeah. of the income, the earning, but they don't know how to manage it. And your income comes a lot differently than a banker's income. Mm-hmm. So there are different financial planning institutes that specialize in healthcare. And I always feel bad saying this because as young financial planners, that's a hard business to, to grow and get into, but you want to have a five, 10 year experienced financial planner because of how important it is yeah. for them to help you managing your money. And they're not just putting you in the same program that they've put all their other clients in because you do have more opportunity to be investing more at certain times. So it's very good to have someone that specifically knows. Um, I have a great financial planner friend myself. His wife is a doctor. So for me, no matter how long he would be in the industry, he kind of gets it because he's dealing with that income already. So that's safe. But your average kind of, turn key box financial planner, they may not have the knowledge to really benefit you as a doctor where there are people that specialize in that. So would you call, how do you find these people? Ah, <laughs> I'm trying to see where my notes are on that too. Word of mouth referrals. Mm. When you're in residency, you are literally bumping Go to the doctor's elbows. lounge. Yes, hundred <laughs> percent. And, and I made this joke when I came on at court, I said, you know, I want to have two surgeons working together and in, in the middle of surgery, one of them complain about banking and the other surgeon go, well, don't you have a Brandon? Like yeah. I want that. That's how I want my name to be known in, in the doctor community. But on the flip side of that, they talk about that stuff all the time because once one doctor has a bad experience, yeah. they don't want others to have that experience too. So word of mouth referral is one of the greatest things in your uh, industry 
because let them have the rough times and you get the benefits of, yeah, nope, I've had this person for 20 years, never done me wrong, here's their card. Yeah. And really, that's how I've grown the department quite a bit is that word of mouth referral. Interesting. All right. The doctor's lounge, I'm telling it you, is. over lunchtime. Although I can't imagine the stories. You can in the get doctor's a lot of lounge. advice. No, yeah, there's there's quite a few conversations <laughs> happening in there. And but sometimes you do hear people talking about money, you know, and uh, but but it's also something that I feel like money is something that people don't just freely talk about a lot, you know, mm-hmm. like you could be struggling, you could have a lot of money. I don't know. That just seems like a card people don't really pull out all that often. I've learned those who like flaunt and talk about money are usually the worst managing their money. They're not the single guy with two dogs. <laughs> you got it. Yep, you got it. And actually, single female. Most of those were women with their two dogs buying their homes. And I was just so excited to be part of their journey because it was like, this is it. so cool. I love it. I love it. Okay, so so there's loan options that are tailored for medical professionals. Mm-hmm. So go ask about it, you know, when you're buying that first home, um, especially. But let's talk about um, loan repayment because mm-hmm. now you got your you got your big job with your big paycheck and you're going to buy a house. How, how do you strategize with the budget of paying back this loan <laughs> and investing? Because you said it's never <sighs> well, plant and, the oak tree. And let's, let's play the fun game of, so you're paying on your student loans consistently and you have a $500 a month payment. Government says, you know what? We're going to defer these for gosh knows how long. So you don't have to make this payment anymore. One of the worst things you can do is take that money and start using it for another investment. Unless it's a cash investment where you're making money on the money. But the story of that we talked about where there was somebody that had student loan frozen. They were not doctors on the news, but they had their student loan was frozen. They bought a home because they could afford it. When the student loan was unfrozen, they could not find the money to pay back what they Mm -hmm. once were paying. So when you're looking at scheduling and budgeting now, these loans that you're taking on, number one, don't overextend yourself. Just because you're making this as a gross income does not mean that you can afford all these things. We talked about that mortgage that's too big, yeah. right? Step down a couple steps on your home. In Omaha, you can still get a phenomenal home yeah. at a very reasonable price. Now, on the coast and all that, that's it's a totally different story. I don't even understand how you manage money in California. This, like, this makes anymore. me think of these shows that you watch on like the Travel Channel, and they're like... <laughs> We're helping John and Karen find their home. And like the budget's like three, like where are these people? Oh, it is crazy. Uh, like a one bedroom, one bathroom home yes. in California can easily be a million dollars or more. Come to Nebraska. I know. Guys. It's a good life. A million life. bucks, you get a compound it's really here. good amazing. here. It's amazing. Really so, it, so it goes into the same lines of how most people should manage their money, no matter what your profession is. But the problem is, it's that winning lottery theory. You're getting a big number and you love this number. And you would think there's no way I could spend this kind of money, but you easily can spend that kind of money yeah. very, very quickly. Now, Will a financial advisor tell you like, hey, you're spending too much money? Will your banker tell you that? No, it's no. not our responsibility. It's really not our place to tell you how to use your money or spend it. If you ask, we'll definitely give you recommendations. But that's where if you had a budget when you started in your residency or even in school, that budget is going to evolve tremendously, but you're still going to have the savings bucket. Uh, the investing bucket and then the fun money bucket and the food. And you'll still have kind of that habit of putting that money in those areas so that you can afford life. Cause the saddest thing I have seen is a doctor wanted to add an, ex- uh, uh, my God. well, no, they wanted to redo their main floor whole thing. And so they came home to renovation. me, home renovation. They came to me to talk about a loan. And the problem was, is the renovation once done would have put them so far out of their price range within the the um, subdivision that there's no way they could appraise that house and get back the money that mm. they're putting into it. Well, when we looked at alternate ideas, everything was maxed out. I mean, I had no place where I could find money for him. So talk through, fortunately, I wasn't able to help. Turns around, he goes, that's okay. I just cashed out some of my life insurance and I'll get it taken care of that way. That's not great. That's not, that's not a solution yeah. to that situation. But again, I mean, he had quite a bit in life. So ah, what's a little taken off the top? Well, you continue to do that and you're going to end up with nothing. Right. So when it comes to repayment of the loans, number one, when things happen where you don't have to pay something, keep making that payment. Maybe not 
to that Maybe specific a smaller thing. amount or smaller amount or put it in a high interest savings account. So you're not going to touch it. It's earning money. And then if they flip that switch again, it's sitting there. Mm -hmm. You're ready to use it. Now, of course, minus emergencies and, and all those things. Uh, so that's one opportunity there. But then two, if you're going to borrow more than you can afford, and it's funny, you can't borrow more than 50% of your income for your home. And mm -hmm. every mortgage that I did where we were really close to that, I mean, it was one of their paychecks went directly to their mortgage. Yeah. I'm like, are you sure you want to do this? Yeah, how are you going to eat? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it's the same concept of managing money, no matter who you are, but the earlier you can get into the habit of a budget, the better. And again, coming from a commission sales background where it was almost impossible to budget when I was 23 years old, I, I had jealousy towards those that had a salary because you know what you're going to bring in and you know what's going out. If you can maintain that, that's where you can really yeah. do well. Are there good like apps or software programs for somebody that's like, I don't know how to, I don't know how to create a budget or is this something oh, yes. that their banker can really help them with? Uh, what it, chat GPT, the AI thing. I bet they can make a better budget than any of us. Google, unfortunately. Google, tell me what my budget is. <laughs> kind of, yeah. Yeah. I think the hardest part of the budget though is sticking to it. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's where my family Execution is everything. Absolutely. You can have the best laid plans on paper, but if you go spend your food money on the bar the night before, yeah, you're probably not going to reach your goal by the end of that month. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How about if you have kids? Does that change any of this conversation that we're having? <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Big time. How so? Well, you have an extra expense that you can't fully predict. They are very expensive. They are very expensive. We do Catholic school and we had one daughter uh, that was still in daycare and that's a hefty penny. Mm -hmm. And then the other daughter, we, that was her only tuition that we had to pay. So I had that mindset and this just all happened. Like I had literally kindergarten. Uh, <laughs> I had the mindset of, we just got this pay raise because we're not paying half a daycare as our tuition. Yeah. And now we have all this other money. Well, Dr. Seaman, I have no clue where that pay raise went because <laughs> it seems like we're still right on the Some... cusp of all of them. We had three kids in daycare at one point and oh. I kept thinking, and then we had to make a decision to hold them as six-year-olds for kindergarten because they were summer birthdays. And it was like, one more year of daycare. Yeah. Maybe I should just send her early. <laughs> You wouldn't thinking be the only the, person thinking the same that. thing. Yeah. That so, it would be a Paris. So that's where, and, and I guess I don't have a great answer because I can't figure it out. Kids are an, an additional expense that you're never going to be able to, I don't know. I'm probably wrong on this, but I don't know how to budget with kids because we're on the third sweater for one of my kids for yeah. their school because they keep losing them. Yeah. You know, I budgeted clothes. Well, now we're buying more clothes. So do kids throw a wrench in it? Absolutely. But name one thing in life that a kid doesn't adjust or change. Yeah. So again, the more structure you have going into it, the easier it's going to be to say, okay, well, now we got to cut this budget a little to put it over here, or cut this fund to put it over here. So you're going to be ahead of the game. If you're already stretched and then you put a kid on top of that, I mean, the expense alone will just continue to stretch you. Yeah. Yeah. I remember we had our kid. I had one child in medical school, two in residency. I have what? no idea how we did it, you guys. <laughs> But, um, but I thought, you know, the kids would be young. They wouldn't even know how crazy our life was at that point, you know, because they're so little, but there was a point, I can't even remember which daughter it was or how old she was, but we drove by the hospital and she goes, that's where mommy lives. And I was like, Oh, oh God. <laughs> um, I, now they don't know any different. You know, I run out in the middle of the night and deliver a baby. Mom, course, did you deliver right. a baby last night? Like, it's just, you know, they, they know that's what I do. Um, but it's, it's, it's a hard decision, you know, when you have mm -hmm. a family and I'm thankful that I had a partner that had an income that could help, you know, support our family. And that's honestly why we made the decision to have kids then. But um, they are expensive. That is they a are. very true statement. Um, okay, so I am in private practice. Mm -hmm. So I now own, you know, my practice with, with several other people. But when I was coming out, I'm looking at jobs. Do I work for an academic institution? Do I work for a hospital? Do I go into private practice? Do I start my own practice? Mm -hmm. Obviously, some of those routes are a little more financially secure because you work for them and you're just going to take that big fat paycheck versus, you know, buying into a practice or starting your own practice, which could cause you to need to take more money out. Mm -hmm. like you've been taking money out for a really <laughs> long time. Does it but, ever end? Uh, and I'm very happy that I went that route. I like being my own boss, but mm -hmm. talk to me for somebody that's kind of coming out and, and job searching out of residency for this big job. You know, do you have advice in that regard of those so, avenues? To me, 
you could even take the whole physician piece out of it. Uh, okay. I'm very fortunate. I traveled around Wyoming, South Dakota, and Nebraska. I worked with a bunch of business owners specifically. And one thing I've learned, and as an entrepreneur, I hope you don't take this in the wrong way, but as a true entrepreneur, you got to be a little off just a little bit because you take risks that the average human would be like, oh, no, 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 that's a horrible yeah. idea. But those risks have reward. Absolutely. And entrepreneurs know that reward is much greater than this tiny little risk that I'm taking now. And everybody's telling me I'm crazy and all of this. Well, they, they're ready to do it. I think the physician world is the exact same thing. If you are not the type of person that wants to run a 1099, spend seven hours with your CPA about every quarter. If that's not you, go to your big hospital, let them take care of you. Your insurance is covered. You get all the perks, all that fun stuff. But like you said, you like to be your own boss. Mm -hmm. You like to run the show. That's that entrepreneur piece that you probably are on a much better path to where you're going to make more money just in the long run yeah. because you're doing what you love, how you love to do it. So you can just take, how did you do in school for your early jobs? Was it easy to work at the grocery store and be told what to do? Or right. were you working at the grocery store and you're like, look, I made a pyramid of soda because I thought that'd be neat. And then you get yelled at. It's the same concept. It's just its own world on the practice, private practice. I call it the big box practice yeah. where you're in a big hospital with all that support. And what I see, and a lot of entrepreneurs are the same way, you might start at that big hospital. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've got the, you know, the insurance and all that, but it only lasts for so long yep. before you step out. I think that that's a great way to get patients, though, because you're in a setting where they probably just called the phone number yep. or maybe referred. So and so hospital. And they met you. I yeah. tell you the truth, my dentist is because I had a root canal I needed to be done. And I went to 911 Dental on Dodge Street. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so after my follow-up, when it was all said and done, we finished up and he goes, hey, can I walk you out? <laughs> I was like, never had a dentist walk me into my car, but sure. Something happens, something going to happen. <laughs> but so when we went out, he goes, I'm looking to start my own practice. Would it be okay? Can you give me your contact if I would reach out for you mm -hmm. to be a patient? Now, he couldn't do it inside, right? I'm yeah. sure there were laws and regulations. <laughs> But to show that passion, yeah. I'm still with him today. Mm -hmm. And I've been away from that Dodge Street for a long time. So that's where I think it's not uncommon to go to a big hospital that has processes in place, but then you're going to go off on your own. Yeah. And I do think, and you can correct me on this, but there's different professions in the medical world that suit you better to go off on your own versus being at a hospital. Uh, anesthesiologist to me is going to benefit much better in a big hospital where they're very busy and moving around yeah. versus trying to cover enough practices to make a good paycheck for them as an independent right. anesthesiologist. Right. So I think I, I am missing that little bit where I should be yeah. a good entrepreneur. But when I've gotten close to taking that big risk, I've always had the fear. Yeah. I truly have. And I've never made that big jump. But if you find yourself in that position, especially in the medical world, you have somewhat of a client base. I think you should take the jump. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm a huge benefits. fan of it. I, you know, when you're, and we're, we're just seeing so many shifts in healthcare of mm. you're not seeing many private practices anymore because the overhead is very expensive <laughs> and the loans are very expensive. And so people are selling out to hospitals and just to, because they don't want to be business people yep. and it is definitely not for everybody. But I mean, I'll just make up some numbers. You know, when you're coming out of residency, this hospital over here is like, we're going to give you $400,000. You're going to come have this like, you know, amazing job and this, and that, and the other, but they're, they're going to tell you how many patients to see a day. Yeah. And then the second year, they're going to be like, yeah, you didn't actually hit the RVU numbers that we wanted. So we're actually going to drop your salary down to 350. You know, these wow. things can happen. Whereas in private practice, they may say, okay, listen, you're only going to get 200,000. You're going to kind of buy your way into this partnership and whatever. But then a couple of years down the road, your salary is essentially unlimited. Mm -hmm. It's how hard do you want to work? I mean, I work in private practice and kind of the mantra is like, eat what you kill. So mm -hmm. if you want to make a lot of money, you work really hard. And if you don't want to work as hard and don't make as much, that's fine too. Everybody has to find their balance. But it is scary when you've accrued all of this debt and you've made all of these <laughs> like, you know, risky investments. But at the same time, I think it's understanding. And you've said this, there's a low default rate on physician loans. Yep. They have, uh, they have skills and assets. There is a worth to them. And people see that. Financial institutions see that. Yep. That's why there's services that are created for physicians. That is correct.
That yeah. is correct. Yeah. I, that's my plug, you guys. I like the private practice world, but if you don't want to pick out the staplers and hire and fire and it is risky. I mean, like the pandemic, for instance, was very risky being in private practice and, yeah. you know, the clinics are shut down, the hospitals limiting how much surgery you can do. That was scary, you know, for us, but I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan of that. Um, okay. Let's talk about, um, financial strategies for balancing work and life. Ah, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to say the blanket statement. You will never find a perfect work and life balance. I traveled and I wanted to find that. And it just, it's, it's hard to do, but what I learned and, and I did have someone tell me this, this is not my own, but give a hundred percent wherever you are. And when the balance is off, at least you're still giving credit to where credit is due to your family, to your employees, to your clients. That to me is where you want to find balance. Now, if you're never taking vacation, that's on you. You know what I mean? It, it might be stressful. And, and some people, and, and I'm sure physicians, especially they feel if I leave, who is going to do all this? Yeah. And, and, Actually, I probably see it more in the admin side. Well, I know how to do all the coding. So if I leave, how are you going to get the coding done? Well, great news. It's going to get done or it'll be here when you get back. I know. We what don't understand. Two? We are replaceable. <laughs> yes. So that that mentality is what's really going to put you in the grave early because you are meant to take breaks. I think more and more companies are pushing. We're not going to let you roll over your vacation yeah. because we want you to you use have to it. Take it. Yes. And I think that's very important. So when you get into that mindset of, I have to be here, I can't get away from this place. That's not going to help at all. That's not going to help at all. Yeah. It's a, I'm an OBGYN. So like I guilty as charged. It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a hard um, life. And the fact that we are so attached to our patients and my husband can totally speak to this. I get a little bit of vacation anxiety because I leave town and my patients might have their baby while I'm gone. And like they came to see me and, you know, um, but, uh, it's, it's hard. And then sometimes as a physician, you feel like when you leave the office, you almost get punished when you come back because oh, like now the, the inbox is like full again and, <laughs> but you have to do it. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just the, the rate of physician burnout is real. And these probably are the percentage of people that are defaulting on their, you know, mortgages because, you know, you've created this amazing life. And then you're like, this isn't what I signed up for. No, nor can you enjoy the $2 million home you bought because you're always in the office. So why yeah. not have a nice condo? I think condos are kind of funny in Omaha because again, the cost of what you pay for a condo versus what you can get for a home is, right. is pretty off there. Uh, but, but to your point, if you're not taking that time to relax you're actually doing a disservice to your clients too. True. But all this said, I am the banker that will answer my text message anytime from a doctor because that's what I told you I would do. Yeah. But that's coming from, I've created a culture in my house. Instead of me being gone from Monday to Thursday traveling, I might sneak away for 10 minutes during our family movie night or something on those lines to answer this message. That's it. And I communicate because my wife is also in private banking. So she'll have to do the same thing for her clients, yeah. but we communicate to each other. I'm not going to go sit on my phone for 20 minutes. I'm actually going to go take care of something really quick. Can you cover the kids? Great. And that's how we keep our clients happy. But then we also keep a life to ourselves. Communication, communication, communication. Yeah. <laughs> if we were doing a marriage podcast, that would be like the yeah. one thing I'd be like, <laughs> just communicate it makes it a little easier. Um, uh, what about two physician households? Is there anything that's super common different to think about super, there or super common? I'm not married to another doctor and I like that, but right. Yeah. Um, I think it goes into kind of the military concept too, where a lot of military people end up getting married because you are engulfed in this world that you are mm -hmm. in and you don't have a lot of options to get away. So I don't know, you're here, I'm here. Let's make it happen. Uh, but no, a lot of my clients are married physicians. Does it change the dynamics? Not a lot. Um, I just have to put doctor on both of the double the loans yep. and <laughs> but, <laughs> but what I've noticed with that is they have usually found some type of system, right? And especially the overnights uh, that I've noticed or, or doctors that are on call a yeah. lot. The other physician generally has to have some flexibility or some they have to take. get there. Right. Especially with kids, mm -hmm. especially with kids. So when it comes to the two physician household, again, how I have structured my concept and kind of my culture of their banker, I love it because if I can't get one, I can get the other and they know that we'll make this happen. Uh, but as far as being a challenge, I don't know. I mean, 
you would know better in that world. In the okay, household I'm, I'm side. very interested that this question just came to my mind. But in two physician households, is it typically the male or the female that is running the finances? Do you really want to know? Yeah, I do. Male. Yeah. Okay. All it right. is. It is. And I don't I don't know why. But then I primarily deal with the wife when it comes to <laughs> the day in and day out stuff. But it's yeah. like I'll manage this. No, please. <laughs> yep, kind of that whole online thing. Like when it comes to what account is the interest bulldog. high, that's yeah. usually the male. And then when it comes to moving around and getting the kids dance paid for and everything, uh, generally, yep, that is the female that I, I deal with yeah. on that side. Okay. Because you work in mortgages uh, so much, thinking about financial investment strategies for physicians, you mentioned a lot of them do real estate mm-hmm. investments. Yep. Is that like a, but what if you don't have the time to be a landlord? I mean, no. is that? Here's the beauty. Uh, so there are property managers out there. And it, again, if you, if you are investing into real estate because you want to have $2,000 more a month in, in pay, right? Which <laughs> takes a lot of houses to get there. But you're doing it for the specific purpose of, I want to grow my income. Mm -hmm. What I see with physicians is absolutely the income's there. But there's also tax breaks. And as an independent contractor like yourself that owns your own business, to be able to roll some stuff over in a real estate LLC, there's options. There's like good benefits to that. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much that they want that money. Plus, real estate, ironically, can be a better investment than a retirement program. Because you can be more lucrative. You can make more off of it. So what I see is they're using it as the investment strategy, not the Airbnb strategy. Yeah, it's they're, like pay off the house. You and got it. it yep. They're not in there switching the laundry. They're not pulling it for the next client to come in or anything like that. They have property managers that take those late phone calls, that take care of all of that stuff. Do you pay for that? Absolutely. Yeah. But again, if your ultimate goal isn't just to make a paycheck for yourself, because these doctors are not going to quit what they're doing. They love what they're doing. But now they have an additional stream of income and tax breaks that they can use. So again, making your money work for you is a huge advantage. So I think real estate investing in a physician world is fantastic idea. Fantastic. I've seen a lot of my colleagues do it. And uh but I, it's like, it's not my area of expertise. I'm a gynecologist. Right. Like I deliver babies. Like I don't know the first thing about that. So you really have to look for the the professionals that do. Well, Brandon, this has been so fun. I and agree. I, I agree. know that people are going to get so much out of this. Please tell people where they can find you if they're local okay. and if they want to work with you. Yep. Awesome. I appreciate the opportunity. So uh, Brandon Suba, I am at Core Bank. Uh, I am the healthcare relationship manager there, but my email is bsuba, S-O-U-B-A, with a B as in boy in front of it, at corebank.com, or my phone number is 402-321-0323, and that is the number that all doctors get, so you can text it, the concierge line. Well, and my cell phone. So... (laughs) We do have a concierge line on top of it. I hope it doesn't ring at 2 a.m. like my phone does. But You know, it's funny that I always preface it. I'm like, you can text and call me at 2. I probably won't answer, but I will know what your challenge is in the morning. Because I do have overnight doctors that I work with. And again, that's your daytime. Yeah. So I encourage them. I'm you're not going to wake me up. Essentially now two kids in. I sleep real well. But at least I know what it is right away. So when you go home, do your routine and go to bed. Yeah. When you wake up to go to your shift, I have all that time to work on stuff so that I can give you a good answer. You can go into your shift and just have a nice day. I love that. You can spend your time doing what uh, what you really need to do. Absolutely. Well, this has been great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity having me on. Thanks for listening to today's episode. I hope you guys got a lot out of it. I don't know about you. I'm a doctor. I do doctor work. I don't do banking. And he gave a lot of good advice that I know we all could use. So if you guys can help us share this episode, like, subscribe to the channel, we always appreciate it. Core Bank, member FDIC. CoreBank is an equal housing lender. The information shared on this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations. When making decisions about your financial situation, consult a financial professional for advice. Comments on this podcast are not regularly updated and information may become outdated.